Before we get to tonight's uh, talk, I'd like to um, make a couple of announcements and, and uh, let you know where we're headed uh, for the fall and for next week. Um, again, I, can't, I have to always thank my great friend Arturo Marchuca uh, from the Houston Airport Systems who manages the Houston Spaceport. Uh, he's been a great sponsor of this lecture series for a number of years, and if you've been following the newspapers, there's lots of great stuff happening down in Ellington Field, and there's more to come in the next few months, so uh, keep your eye out on that. We will have a functioning spaceport doing cool stuff uh, pretty soon. Um, the other thing is, I uh, just want to give you a couple of heads up about events that are coming up. Most of you, I think, are on our mailing list. If you're not, please write to us, and we'll make sure you're on it. We have an RSI uh, members mailing list, and we also have our Spaceport Frontiers mailing list. This kind of grew independently, and we're going to at some point try and at least put some of those aspects together. Uh, next Friday, April 12, which is Yuri's night, um, we will be having uh, the NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. I think it was 97, he's a rice owl. Um, and he'll be coming and giving uh, a conversation with NASA Administrator. So hopefully you've seen that message. Um, right now, it's, it's slated to be in this room at the same time as usual. If for some reason we get a, a larger than usual response, that's why we're encouraging everybody to RSVP right now. There's no tickets. It just gives us a head count, and if it turns out we've got too many for this room, we might try and find another auditorium, which at Rice is very difficult. Um, anyway, play, please pay attention to that. A very early heads up, um, and you'll forget all of this until we send you the reminders, is in September 12th which is, will be the 57th anniversary of President Kennedy's speech at the Rice Stadium. Um, we've been working with the Kennedy Library and the Foundation and the University Space Research Association to host an event um, discussing the legacy of Kennedy, what's happening in space. You might see this guy again. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that's something just to put on your radar for September 12th. Um, the other thing, I'd like to thank the Abbey family, which is uh, large and prosperous. It's great to see them. I've, I've interacted with a few of them over the years. It's nice to see, especially the younger generation and the scientists among them uh, here tonight. And you can find out all about them when you buy and read the book, uh, The Astronaut Maker. There's some interesting family stories in there. And then before, again, we get started, um, we have an Apollo 7 astronaut in the room, Walt Cunningham, if you don't mind Walt saying hello. And his lovely wife, Dot, who's uh, sitting right beside him. So thank you for joining me uh, tonight, too. There's also a few sort of well-kent faces, as we say in Scotland, from NASA uh, in the room. Um, I'm sure they'll make themselves known, people like Mark Craig and then a few of the younger guys, too. OK, so um, normally what I would do is I'd p pick out this piece of paper and read the biography of our speaker. I decided not to do that tonight, partly because you've all bought the book, so you'll learn more than I could tell you and it is on the website and on the poster. But I think, um, and the reason why I didn't want to do all of that is because I've already talked long enough and we don't have time. And the only word really to describe tonight's speaker when it comes to space is a legend. I mean, the, the man, as you get to know him and what he's done in his career and his life is just absolutely astounding. And we wouldn't be here talking in Houston talking about space program in large part if it wasn't for George Abbey. So I think, that's as much as I can say that is, uh, you know, it's heartfelt and, and, and what he has done for, for what we're all interested in. And personally, in the last maybe eight or nine years, I've been working closely with George. He helps whenever he can. He basically, I have some stupid idea and he picks up the phone and you're, next thing you know, you're talking to the head of the Russian Space Agency. So he's been really, really helpful to us at Rice and particularly us at the Rice Space Institute. And so that's a personal thanks just for everything that you do for us as well as, uh, as the community. So, please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Mr. George Abbey, the astronaut maker. Well, thank you, David, and uh, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I thought uh, I might uh, reflect a little bit on the past this evening, uh, looking at uh, our ongoing space activities and uh, some uncertainty relative to our future activities, I think there's a lesson to be learned looking at the past. And uh, in that this is uh, 
the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo, and uh, I think Apollo was probably a, a good point, place to start and uh, a good place to uh, talk about how it was accomplished and uh, how it was done. It uh, really got started uh, about 62 years ago this October when uh, the Soviet Union launched uh, a satellite, and that was on October 4th of 1957. And that got the attention of the Western world and certainly got the attention of the United States because if the Soviet Union had that kind of capability, they could certainly launch ICBMs and uh, cause some great destruction. So uh, with that, uh, with that uh, event, uh, the United States really uh, put a great deal of effort into uh, engineering, getting more students into engineering and science. They made an investment, a substantial investment in that, and uh, the country's been living off that investment probably for the last 50 years. But over and above that, uh, they uh, decided that they would uh, focus the space activities and try to uh, get them all in one agency, and uh, they formed NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a year later in October of 1958. And uh, in uh, December of that year, uh, NASA started a, uh, a manned spaceflight program uh, to put an astronaut into orbit. And of course, the Russians are, during that time period had also been doing a great deal. They've been flying animals and uh, even flew a dog that uh, gave birth to a puppy that uh, gave uh, uh, one of the puppies to the President of the United States. And uh, they uh, continued to accomplish great things in space. And uh, in 1960, we had an election. And in 1961, we had a new president come in, John F. Kennedy. And he came in in January. And uh, with a lot of promise uh, about he would change things and make things for, for the better, there was uh, what at that, was, at that time it was called a missile gap. We were behind the Soviet Union and he was gonna fix that. And uh, there was great promise with this new administration. Well, that went on for a, a few months and then after about three months, an event occurred that uh, really electrified the world again. The Soviet Union launched a human in space, Yuri Gagarin on April 12th of 1961. And uh, the Sputnik, the launch of the satellite, had gotten everybody's attention, but certainly launching Yuri Gagarin even caused more of a consternation. And uh, then about five days later, six days later, there was an uh, uh, invasion of Cuba that didn't go well. And uh, with those two events, the president was uh, greatly concerned and greatly embarrassed that his administration had gotten off to a start that was not good. And uh, in uh, late April, uh, they had formed a space council when they formed NASA, and the president was, his, was the head of the space council. But in April, late April, uh, he asked the Congress to make the vice president head of the space council. So Lyndon Johnson was head, made head of the space council. And uh, President Kennedy asked Lyndon Johnson and the space council to come up with a recommendation of uh, a program that would at least give us a 50-50 chance of uh, beating the Soviet Union before uh, they did it. And uh, on May 5th of 1961, we launched our first astronaut in space, Alan Shepard. Uh, he didn't go into orbit. He went uh, up about 116 miles and went downrange at uh, the Kennedy Space Center and landed in the water about 302 miles downrange. But uh, that was at least a, a, a start. And so uh, on May 8th, uh, the vice president made a recommendation to John F. Kennedy that we ought to go to the moon and return astronauts safely back to Earth. And on May 25th, three weeks after Alan Shepard flew, President Kennedy went to the Congress and he made a quite long speech. It covered a lot of, a lot of different topics. And right at the end of the speech, he made the uh, comment about the space program. And he said that he was uh, going to start a program that would go to the moon and return astronauts safely to the Earth and do it by the end of the decade. And uh, there was a lot of silence in the audience and then finally there was great applause. And that was the start of the Apollo program. It got underway at that time. 
uh, even though its heritage went back to the days of Sputnik. But uh, at that point, NASA did not really know how they were going to do it. They just knew that we were going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. And there are a lot of different approaches to doing that. And uh, one approach was a direct ascent to the moon with a large booster. Another approach was uh, many launches and doing assembly in Earth orbit. But there was an engineer at Langley Research Center, which was part of NASA, named John Hubel, and he had a concept called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And that wasn't getting a lot of consideration. So he wrote a letter directly to the Deputy Administrator of NASA, Bob Siemens, which was kind of out of channels, but it, uh, nevertheless, he sent it to him. And that started to get attention when uh, the Deputy Administrator looked at it. And finally, after about uh, nine months of study, they concluded that was the approach that we would use to go to the moon, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous which did involve a large booster. And uh, at that point in time, we were developing a large booster that became the Saturn V at Huntsville, Alabama. And with the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, that gave us uh, contracts really for two spacecraft that were needed, a command and service module that the crew would travel back and forth to the moon in, but also a lunar module that would do the actual landing on the moon and they would all go together in one, one launch vehicle. And that was the start of the program. Uh, we hadn't, at that point when Kennedy made that speech, we hadn't even flown John Glenn in orbit. He flew in orbit in February of 1962. And so uh, we had a long ways to go before we really got to the moon. But uh, after we had des decided on the lunar orbit rendezvous, it was clear that we needed to really learn, learn how to do rendezvous and dockings in space and uh, develop the systems that we would need to do a uh, mission to the moon, the fuel cells and the other systems. So Mercury was still going on and we started another program called Gemini. And Gemini was really a crucial activity because that was really the, the pathway to really to get to the moon and, and we would not have been successful in Apollo had we not done that. The Mercury program continued to fly, and uh, it flew the first flight in uh, 1961, and it flew its last flight, six uh, manned flights, in 1963. And then Gemini started flying in March of 65, and its last flight was flown in November 1966. And it was a very successful program. We flew 10 manned missions uh, in Earth orbit, and we were able to not only uh, do rendezvous and dockings, but we were able to really extend the time we had stayed in space by a, a much longer period of time, at least equal to a mission to the moon. Gordon Cooper had flown the last Mercury flight, which was the longest flight we had flown up to that point in time, and that was just one day in about 10 hours. So Gemini was a, a critical activity. And all during that time when Mercury and Gemini were, were really going on, we were working on the Apollo program. And so Gemini ended in November 1966, and uh, the first Apollo mission was scheduled to fly in, Jan in February 1967. Let's And this is the crew of the first, uh, the first mission. It was Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. And they were scheduled to fly, as I say, in February of uh, 1967. And they had completed their training and uh, the spacecraft was at the Cape. And uh, all was in preparation for their flight. This is the three astronauts. And that's a picture of their spacecraft. And this is a picture of the spacecraft on the pad. And uh, usually about a month before we do a launch, we do a countdown demonstration test, which is a really a rehearsal of the whole launch. And so Jan in January of 1967, on the 27th of January, they were doing a countdown demonstration test with the crew on board the vehicle. And in fact, Walt Cunningham, who was in the backup crew, was there at the Cape and had been working with the crew all during that preparation time. 
and uh, had reviewed uh, the test procedures the night before. And uh, so the crew was in the spacecraft and uh, we uh, had the hatch closed and we were, uh, had 100% oxygen in the spacecraft because we were flying with 100% oxygen. And there were a lot of uh, flammable materials in the spacecraft, nylon, Velcro, and other flammable materials. And unfortunately, in those days, uh, we didn't really take as much care uh, going in and out of the spacecraft and working in the crew cabin as we should have. And uh, the workers, I think, uh, in the process of working inside had damaged the wiring. And so we had a spark, and uh, the spark ignited the uh, the nylon, and we had a fire inside the spacecraft. At that point in time, we had an inward opening hatch, and the crew couldn't get the hatch open. And uh, unfortunately, we lost all three astronauts. They didn't burn to death, but the, uh, they uh, were appreciated by the smoke. But that, uh, that was a great tragedy that we had to recover from, and uh, we had to understand what caused the fire, and uh, then we had to go ahead and identify the cause and fix it, and then uh, really come up with a lot of non-flammable materials that would not burn in oxygen. And uh, that was a tremendous task, trying to do that, to come up with materials that didn't burn, and then test them and prove that they didn't burn, and then fabricate everything that we would need inside the cabin, the suits and everything that would be made out of the non-flammable material. And we were successful doing that. and. Uh, it took a good bit of time, uh, and all those materials we developed, uh, they benefit people here on Earth right now. They're in all the airliners that we fly. Uh, they're in the pajamas for a lot of uh, young people, and they're used in all kinds of applications, in racing cars and other, other dangerous applications. So it, it's uh, been a great benefit. But we did, that, did get all that done, and uh, we rede redesigned the hatch. We made it into a quick opening hatch that worked very well. And uh, for those of you that go out to Space Center Houston or have been to Space Center Houston, you can see uh, one of the command modules out there, the last one that we took to the moon, and uh, see that hatch. And it uh, turned out to be a great design. And we also changed a lot of the systems in the spacecraft, improved them, and got more reliability. And uh, then we uh, we felt after uh, going through all that, we were ready to fly. And uh, Walt uh, and his two crewmates were in that crew. And that's, uh, that's uh, Walt's patch right there. <laughs> and there's Walt right there. <laughs> you can recognize him, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, this mission uh, was a really a, a critical mission because the uh, program manager, George Lowe, who I worked for, I was fortunate to work for, a great leader and an individual of great, great vision and a great mentor, uh, had taken a vacation in that September before the flight that was scheduled in October. And uh, he came back from that vacation. He'd been working seven days a week uh, ever since the fire. But he came back uh, with a new idea. He said that if we continued on the present course or the planned missions, that we were not gonna get to the moon by the end of the decade. So he came up with a, a very bold plan that said if Apollo 7 was a successful mission, and Apollo 7 recognized uh, it was the first flight of a, uh, the Apollo spacecraft. If that mission was successful, that would open the way to do a flight two months later to go to the moon, the second flight of the command module. And uh, so Apollo 7 was a really a, a critical mission for the program, and we would not have landed on the moon were not successful. So I think we owed a great de debt of gratitude to Wally and uh, Walt and Don Isley for uh, a great mission, because it was a great mission, and uh, George Lowe sold the leadership of NASA on his approach that if it was successful that we go to the moon two months later. And the administrator of NASA said he didn't want to announce it till after the mission if it was successful. And it turned out to be a great success. And there's uh, Walt being launched. 
And that's one of the great pictures that Walt and his crew took from orbit, which shows uh, all of Florida and shows the, lance, the launch site also. And that was a great, a great mission. And that really opened the door for really the program to go ahead and proceed and fly the next mission to the moon. And that was two months after that. The crew that got assigned to that mission found out about that mission that they were going to be assigned to in September. And they flew it in December. And the other factor that went into that mission was it was going to go on a Saturn V, the large booster. And the Saturn V had only flown two flights. The first flight had been a very successful one. But the second flight, which occurred in April of 1968, uh, was really a disaster because it had severe vibrations in the first stage pogo, and uh, that caused the shutdown of two of the engines on the second stage, uh, caused the third stage engine not to restart, and that engine has to restart if you're gonna go to the moon. It gives you the, the thrust to get out of Earth's orbit to go to the moon. And the spacecraft limb adapter, that part of the, the, the uh, launch vehicle that surrounds the lunar module came apart in flight. That occurred in April, so in addition to working on getting Apollo 7 ready, uh, our friends in Huntsville, Alabama had to solve all those problems with the launch vehicle from April to uh, December to get the Saturn V ready to fly. So after that, that, uh, that flight of uh, April, which was not successful, the next flight of the Saturn V was uh, with a crew on board going to the moon. And this is a patch of the crew going to the moon of the uh, Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. And there are the three astronauts there. And that's the launch of their, their uh, spacecraft. That was in December, December 21st of 1968. A very short time after that Saturn V had had the problem. And that's a picture taken of the Earth, the first one we ever saw, really, uh, as they were on their way to the moon. And that is a great picture. Uh, you can see, see the continents and the continent of the Earth, continent, uh, as you look back, and that's what they saw when they looked back. And they went into orbit around the moon on uh, Christmas Eve in 1968. We should have sound, but I don't know. It... Uh, in order to uh, preclude uh, 
uh, having to dodge mountains. Now you can see the uh, long shadows of the lunar su sunrise. This is the first pictures of people on the Earth had of a close-up of the moon, taken with a television camera out the window. This was Christmas Eve of 1968. We are uh, now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. People all over the world were watching that that night. It was a very emotional period, a very, a very emotional evening. And uh, I think uh, it's long remembered, certainly by all those, of you, all those that saw it that night. It was a great Christmas Eve. They came around the, uh, the moon, and uh, this is what they saw on their first orbit. And uh, this picture has become very famous because you see the Earth out there in that, in that void of darkness and uh, it becomes pretty clear that the Earth is a very fragile, uh, fragile planet that we live on. And uh, I think this picture has raised the sensitivity of people here on the Earth about to, to the environment. And certainly uh, it's an environment that we need to worry about and take care of. But so far uh, on the two missions that we'd flown, we'd flown the command service module now twice. The crew uh, that went to the moon was just in a command and service module. We didn't take the lunar module, so they didn't have to l learn to fly two spacecraft. And it was much simpler for us uh, because we just went into lunar orbit. And uh, we were able to check our navigation and our trajectories and our procedures. And that was uh, uh, really a major step forward for us. But we still had to prove the lunar module. And so the next flight was going to fly two months after the flight to the moon, and it was Apollo 9. And uh, this is a crew of Apollo 9, uh, Jim McDivitt, Abe Scott, and Rusty Schweikert. And they were going to fly on a Saturn V, and they were going to fly in Earth orbit. And we were going to check out the lunar module, the first manned lunar, lunar module mission. So this crew had to fly really two spacecraft. So the Saturn V that took this mission into space was launched with both a lunar module and a command and service module. And uh, when they got into orbit, uh, they were able to separate uh, from the command service module. Two of the astronauts went over into the lunar module, and this is a picture taken by Dave Scott of the lunar module in orbit. And uh, Rusty Swikert and Jim McDivitt were flying it, and they separated uh, from the uh, command and service module by uh, about 111 miles, and then they re-rendezvoused and docked. And uh, they had fired, and coming back to the, the rendezvous and docking, 
they fired the ascent stage, which is the upper part of the lunar module, which is what lifts the astronaut off the surface of the Earth, and they proved that system as well. So the docking went well and uh, the mission went well. And uh, at that point, we thought we would, uh, and we also did an EVA. Rusty Swiker did a stand-up EVA to, with a new spacesuit. But at that point, we thought we would be ready to uh, do a dress rehearsal to go to the moon. So two months later, we flew uh, Apollo 10. And uh, this is the patch of Apollo 10. This is a crew, uh, Gene Stern, John Young, and Tom Stafford. And uh, this mission was again on a Saturn V. It would take a lunar module uh, to the moon with a command and service module. So the crew had to learn to fly two spacecraft. And the lunar module and command module would go into lunar orbit, and then they would separate in lunar orbit and make a, a descent. The two astronauts, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan, would make a descent over the landing site that we uh, would end up using for Apollo 11. This is a launch of uh, Apollo 10, and that is a picture taken by John Young of the lunar module in lunar orbit. And uh, as I say, uh, the ascent stage was that part that is used to come up off of the moon. And so Gene Cernan and uh, Tom Stafford flew uh, down at a low altitude over the landing site to about 40,000 feet. And then they fired the ascent engine and came back up and rendezvoused. They didn't land, but they took pictures of the landing site. They were actually too heavy to land. But the mission was very successful and uh, they returned safely to the Earth. And uh, two months later, we thought we'd be ready to fly Apollo 11. And uh, we were in Apollo 11 with uh, certainly this crew that you all know, Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. And uh, this is their vehicle going to the pad. And uh, this is their vehicle being launched. And that's, uh, that's, that is a picture taken from the television of Neil coming down the ladder. So that was the first, first individual to step surface on, on, on the surface of the moon. We had a television camera that was mounted on a lunar module so we could point it at the ladder so we could see the astronauts as they came down and then use it to point around close to the lunar module where they were working. And uh, this is Neil just before he stepped down on the surface of the moon. And uh, this is a picture of Buzz uh, by the flag that they put up on the moon. Uh, you don't see pictures, uh, real photographs of Neil on the moon because he was carrying a camera. So the only pictures you see really are Buzz. But needless to say, this was a great mission. And uh, we had, uh, when we got the astronauts back, safely back home, we could say we completed uh, really uh, what the president had set us out to do, uh, to land on the moon and bring the astronauts safely back to Earth by the end of the decade. And uh, it had been a very successful eight years. So I think at that point in time, we felt we didn't have to keep flying every two months. So Apollo 12 <laughs> uh, was going to be flown four months later. And uh, this is a patch of the crew for Apollo 12. And this is the Apollo 12 crew, uh, Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and Al Bean. And uh, at that point in time, we had uh, concerns about the mass concentrations on the moon affecting our navigation. So we really wanted to uh, do a pinpoint landing of the lunar module, and we wanted to do it close to a, a spacecraft that had landed on the moon, a surveyor spacecraft that had landed in 1967. And uh, on the launch of Apollo 12, we had an unfortunate uh, mishap, though, that uh, kind of set us back. This is a picture of the launch of Apollo 12, and we were struck by lightning. And at that point in time, the astronauts lost all their, uh, all their systems in the spacecraft, the elect electrical power. And uh, we were really in a, uh, in a difficult situation. But uh, fortunately, we had an, a young controller in the, in the control center John Aaron, who had uh, been through, uh, in, during the simulations, been through an exercise where that had happened, and he uh, relayed to the crew what switches to throw, and they regained the electrical power, and then uh, we, uh, once we got into orbit, we orbited the Earth in extra, extra orbit to make sure everything had not been 
adversely affected by the lightning and convinced ourselves that uh, it was okay and we uh, launched on its trajectory to the moon. And uh, there's Apollo 12. You can see the lunar module in the background and the surveyor spacecraft in the foreground. And uh, that's uh, one of the astronauts taking pieces off that surveyor that we brought back because we wanted to see what the effect of that environment was on a spacecraft sitting on it on the lunar surface. But it was a great mission and uh, very successful. And we felt uh, we could fly another mission back to the moon, Apollo 13, four months later. And uh, this is the crew of Apollo 13. That in individual in the middle was not the original crew of Apollo 13. That's uh, Jack Swigert. And uh, that's Fred Hayes and Jim Lovell on either side of Jack. Jack was added to the crew about uh, two days before launch because Ken Mattingly, who was on the crew, had been exposed to uh, measles uh, because one of the a other astronauts' children had measles and there was a concern that Ken would come down with measles in flight. Uh, as it turned out, he didn't, but they replaced him on the crew. And uh, Jack Swigert, who was on the backup crew, uh, had about one day to do a couple runs with the prime crew and went on the prime crew with uh, Fred and Jim. The backup crew actually goes through everything the prime crew does. And on Apollo, we had backup crews to every flight. This is the launch of Apollo 13. And at that point, everything was going great. And uh, when you get into Earth orbit, you fire the third stage of the Saturn V. It takes you on a trajectory to the moon. And then uh, you actually separate from the, the third stage and the crew takes the command module and does a 180 degree turn and picks up the lunar module, which is in the, right above the, the third stage and docks with it as you see in this picture. So they had done that. We were on a trajectory to the moon and we had the lunar module docked with the command module. And uh, we had just, uh, just completed a in-flight press conference uh, with the crew and everything had gone well. And uh, after the conference, one of the controllers uh, asked the crew to stir the liquid oxygen tank, stir the pumps so they could get better readings on the tank. When they did that, there was an explosion in the tank and we lost all our oxygen, we lost our electrical power. And uh, we had really uh, one of our major crises, the first major crises we had in space. Uh, the only oxygen that was available really at that point was over in the lunar module because we had oxygen there in the lunar module to use on the lunar surface. We had batteries in the lunar module, so we had power in the lunar module. So we shut down everything we could in the, in the command module and moved the crew over to the lunar module. And uh, they existed there throughout the mission. It was uh, fortunate that we, when it occurred that we were docked and they could do that. But the lunar module, as it turned out, be a, a great lifeboat for us. And uh, we had to conserve power in the lunar module because it had a limited amount of battery power because on it, it was had batteries just for the time we were on the lunar surface. But they sufficed and we were on a, a trajectory at that point in time called a free return trajectory that went around the moon and then came back to the Earth. Uh, but we had also to do certain mid-course corrections to make sure the spacecraft, when it did come back, landed in the right place where we could recover the crew. And we couldn't use the uh, service module engine because it, it would have been damaged probably in the explosion, which had occurred back in the service module. Uh, so we uh, used, a, again, used the lunar module in a mode that we hadn't used it in before. We used that engine to do our corrections, and we were able to do that. In, uh, in the lunar module, we also had a limited number of lithium hydroxide canisters that were used to scrub the air. And we quickly ran out of those. And uh, the only additional lithium hydroxide canisters we had were in the command module, but they didn't fit in the lunar module. And this is a picture of the crew implementing a procedure we came up with on the ground to show how we could jury rig the lithium hydroxide canisters in the command module to make them work in the lunar module, which they were successful in doing. 
And as they came around back before they entered the Earth's atmosphere, they separated from uh, the service module, they separated from the lunar module, and they went into the command module. We had enough electrical power in the batter batteries in the command module to give us power for entry. And as they looked at the service module, this is a picture they took after they separated, and you can see the damage in this, the whole section of the service module that was blown out there. So it, it uh, turned out to, to be a successful recovery. We got the crew back and uh, they re-entered and the lunar module uh, and the service module went into the Earth's atmosphere and I think the lunar module ended up somewhere near New Zealand. And this is the command module coming down uh, after they came back through the Earth's atmosphere. But we had to understand uh, before we flew again what uh, caused that problem. And we were able to do that. We were able to identify what had gone wrong in the oxygen tank. Uh, the wiring there had uh, been overheated because of a, a design error and then also the tank had been dropped. And so we were able to identify and reproduce the accident and uh, fix the problem. Uh, but we didn't fly again until the following January and flew Apollo 14. Now on each of these missions, particularly after the first mission, we wanted to emphasize science, and so science got to be uh, a high priority on a lot of these missions, and certainly by the time we were flying 13, Apollo 13 and 14, science uh, did take a high priority. And on 14, this is a crew of 14, uh, Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell and Stu Rusa. Uh, and this is a picture of their launch vehicle. Uh, we took on that mission a small cart that they would pull behind them on the lunar surface. This is a picture of the launch. And uh, there's the lunar module on the surface. But on that mission, we did take a small cart that enabled the astronauts to put their equipment on the cart. And uh, as they went around to different sites to pick up samples, they could put them on that cart and carry them. But at the time we were doing all these missions, we also wanted to develop another vehicle that would allow them to go further and do more. And we developed a, a lunar rover, a, a vehicle they could drive on the moon, and it was gonna fly on Apollo 15, which was the next flight. And this is the crew of Apollo 15, Dave Scott, who had flown on Apollo 9, Al Warden, and Jim Irwin. And this is their launch. And this is a, a lunar rover that we actually put on the lunar module. It was designed and built and put on the side of the lunar module. And this shows you where it was located. And this shows you how they actually deployed it on the surface of the moon. It had wire mesh wheels and uh, you can see a, a, a picture of it here. And uh, it had an antenna on it, which the astronaut could point back at the earth. And once he pointed it at the earth, we could control that television camera, the television camera that you see on the lunar, on the lunar rover and follow the astronauts wherever they went. So it, uh, the lunar rover was a very successful vehicle and from, it flew on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. And as I say, the science was emphasized more on each of these missions. Each of the landings was made at a different site, all six landings. And we put, through, uh, put a lot of effort into really determining the optimum landing site for each mission because uh, we wanted to really understand the, the evolution of the moon and how it would relate, related to the Earth. And uh, each of the landings, as you can see in the background, uh, was in a different area. We went in uh, on the Sea of Tranquility on Apollo 11, then we went to highland areas on later flights. The next mission was Apollo 16, and at that point in time, we were flying missions six to nine months apart. And uh, this is a patch of Apollo 16, and this is a crew of Apollo 16, Charlie Duke and John Young and Ken Mattingly, who had been taken off the Apollo 13 crew. <coughs> and in order to train the astronauts for driving the rover on the surface of the moon, we had a lunar rover training vehicle, and that vehicle is on display 
down in Space Center Houston, if you go down there and look at it. And this is that vehicle there. It had hard rubber tires, not to wire mesh wheels, but uh, in every other respect, it was very much like the one that went on the moon. <coughs> and this is the launch of Apollo 16. And that's a picture of North America that John Young took on the way to the moon. And you see, that's probably one of the best pictures we've had of North America. You can see Baja, California, all the way up to uh, Seattle. <coughs> and this is a picture of John Young on the surface of the moon. <coughs> the moon has one sixth gravity of the same uh, one sixth gravity of the Earth, so you can jump a good ways. And oh, thank you. And so this is a picture of John Young saluting the flag, but he's also jumping quite a bit, quite a ways off the Earth. And if you look at the lunar module that is on display down in Space Center Houston, you'll see the ladder that is on that lunar module, that first rung is very high. And it was high because we were very concerned about weight and cutting where, where we could. But the astronauts actually could jump up all the way up to that first rung easily. And this is a picture of Earthrise that was taken by John Young on Apollo 16. And the landing of Apollo 16 in the ocean. The last mission to the moon was Apollo 17. And uh, this is the crew of Apollo 17, uh, Gene Cernan, Ron Evans, and Jack Smith. And uh, as I say, we tried to prepare the astronauts for doing surface work on the moon, doing geology work on the moon. And so we picked uh, training sites here on Earth that were very similar in terrain and make up to uh, what they were on the moon. And so this is a picture of uh, Jack Smith and Gene Cernan uh, going through a, a training exercise out in Arizona. And uh, these were also suited exercises. And this is uh, them going through a suited exercise here on Earth. Now the next picture is the only launch we've ever ever seen of a launch from the moon. And we were able to get it because we had the lunar rover, which had the television camera, and had the antenna that we could point at the Earth. So when the astronauts completed their work on the surface of the moon, we had them point the antenna at the Earth, and then we pointed the uh, television camera at the lunar module because we wanted to see a liftoff. And so this is the only liftoff that we really have of a, a liftoff on the moon. And that's the upper stage going on up with the astronauts. And the mission was quite successful and uh, we brought back a, a, a merit of samples, uh, some excellent samples from the Tars Littrell landing site that we went to on the moon. It was in the Highlands area, in a valley in the Highlands. And it was a very successful mission. And this is uh, uh, the landing, coming in for a landing on the last flight of Apollo. The Apollo program, as I say, was a very successful one. Uh, we flew uh, nine missions to the moon and landed on six of them. And uh, they were all quite successful. Uh, and the mission started, of course, in 68 with Walt on Apollo 7. And the last mission was flown in December 1972. And they, as I said, went to a very number of landing sites. So you can see each of the landing sites was in a different area of the moon. Uh, they were all pretty much near the equator of the moon because we didn't have a lot of the energy that would allow us to go further to higher latitudes on the moon. But I think the samples that we have uh, are excellent samples there at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, investigators every year uh, look into those samples. They're given those samples to do analysis. And they're still doing analyses on these samples. Uh, each year in the woodlands, they have a uh, lunar, uh, lunar planetary, planetary conference. And uh, that has gotten bigger ever since 1969. It's been going on since 69. And uh, it's conducted in March of each year, and it'll be coming up again. Uh, it just occurred, really. I think uh, this finished just last March. It'll be coming up again next year. Uh, it's a great conference, and uh, 
for those of you that want to learn more about this evolution of the moon and the planets and the earth, I would recommend that to you. But if you take a look at the, from that speech that Kennedy gave in 1961, May 25th, it was eight years later we were on the moon. And uh, that's a rather amazing feat. And uh, if you go back and look at how was that accomplished, uh, I think it, it's, there are very, very good lessons that could, you could learn relative to how it was done in those days. Uh, we had good leadership. We had a strong technical organization. We had good young people coming up to, uh, from our colleges that would go into the program. And uh, our leaders had vision and were able to make decisions. But we stopped flying the space shuttle uh, eight years ago this coming July. And uh, we have not put an American in, ast in orbit in all those eight years. In this eight year period, we flew six Mercury flights, we flew 10 Gemini flights, and we flew five Apollo flights in that same eight year period. And we have yet to put an American astronaut up into orbit since the space shuttle stopped flying in July of 2011. So as you reflect on where we are today and where we came from, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, we were able to make decisions in a timely way and we delegated decisions. And as I say, we had good leadership and that's the key to it. We had a, a program on Apollo where we instituted what we call the Configuration Control Board meeting that was, that was occurring every, every week on a Friday. And uh, the major participants in the program all had to participate in person. Every senior director at the Johnson Space Center, uh, the presidents of the companies that were involved from uh, North American Rockwell to Grumman, they all had to be there. And then the individual that was responsible for the system, that system that was being developed, be a, a NASA individual or a contractor, they both had to make a presentation on what they were proposing. If it was a change or if it was a problem or an issue, they had to identify the issue and the problem. The agenda for the meeting was actually put together uh, every Monday and uh, I had the responsibility of putting the agenda together and would identify not only changes, but problems and issues on the program where we had to really resolve this issue or problem. And uh, we would turn that agenda over to the contractors and to the NASA organization on Monday evening and they would have until Friday to come up with a recommendation. And on Friday, we'd have the meeting. Uh, as I say, we'd have the presidents of each of the companies sitting there in Houston and committing the companies. And we had uh, directors of the organizations committing the organizations. And we made the decisions right there on the spot and uh, came out with the decision so everybody knew exactly what we decided and what we were gonna do. And uh, I think that enabled us to really to make the decisions in a very timely way. Uh, that isn't the way it works now. and. Uh, the system we have now, the bureaucracy we have now doesn't allow that kind of an operation. But if we're really going to do something worthwhile and do it on a reasonable time schedule, you need to, you need to operate that way. And as I say, we had a very talented workforce and that made a real difference. And the leadership made a real difference. And uh, I'm concerned that uh, as we look to the future, that unless we some, somehow reestablish some of those very basic concepts that we had in Apollo and were able to do it that way, we we're not gonna be successful. The vice president last week said, we're gonna to go to the moon by 2024. There is no way you're gonna to go to the moon by 2024. There's no way they can, they don't even have a way to get to the moon by 2024. They don't have a way to get to the moon by 2029. They have what they call a lunar gateway that they've never costed out that is probably prohibitively costly. And it's a program that is a space station that orbits a space station. The moon is a God-given space station, and why in the world you'd build a space station to orbit it, Lord only knows. But if you're gonna go to the moon, go to the moon and land on the moon and establish some residence on the moon and scientific stations on the moon. But don't go and put a 
station to orbit the moon. But uh, you need to really look at what we need to do in the future and do it in a reasonable way. And when you do something, build on the, the foundation of what you've done. The people that gave us the Apollo program and enabled us to land on the moon by the end of the decade decided that really the way to go was land a vehicle on a runway and come up with, they came up with a space shuttle. That's who came up with the shuttle. And the shuttle served us well through 30 years. Now we're building three capsules and none of those three capsules are as good as the capsule that Walt flew back in October of 1968. 60, and yet we're building them and the government's paying for them. Boeing's building one, SpaceX building one, Lockheed Martin building one. They don't have any capability to do EVA. You couldn't build another space station in Earth orbit because there's no way to do construction in Earth orbit with the systems we have now. So as you look at where we want to go, as I say, you need to build on what you have. Right now, the Department of Defense is flying a small vehicle like a shuttle, landing on a runway. It's flown at least five or six times successfully and uh, has proven to be a great vehicle. Why can't you really scale that up and you'd have another shuttle that would probably be a better shuttle than the one we had. But you need to consider all these things and really focus on building where you are, building on what you have, and get back to where we, we started because uh, there was a great program as well, can tell you, and uh, great times. And uh, I think uh, we were fortunate to be able to work on it. So thank you all. Who wants to be first? Here we go. I'm going to defer to the younger member and then I'll come right to you. Here you go, sir. Don't be scared, I'm not going to bite. I'm just talking to that so we can. You're being recorded and sent over. Okay. What are you going to ask? Um, just wanted to ask uh, when. Um, when it got struck by lightning, do you know um, if the astronauts ever like like freaked out or anything? <laughs> <laughs> like they were like. David, you want to, what was that? So, um, so what, what's your name? Rocco. Rocco um, basically, you saw the picture of the lightning. You're, the light you're breaking up. Sorry. The picture of the lightning hitting the Saturn mm -hmm. V on, I guess it was Apollo 12. Yes. He asked if um, the astronauts ever freaked out. If they what? If they freaked out. Uh, I think they were a little nervous. <laughs> But I think they maintained their cool, and uh, once they got the, the power back and everything working, they were, uh, they were ready to go on. Thanks, Rock. Okay, my question is more boring. Uh, the day that you found out President Nixon canceled the program, what did you think that day? So, so when President Nixon when when President Nixon canceled the Apollo program, Pardon? when President Nixon canceled the Apollo program, what did you think that day when that announcement came out, okay. when they were deciding not to do an Apollo 18? Well, I can't. I didn't hear you. When, when they canceled the Apollo yes. program, what did you think that day? What when the lightning hit? The what did you think they canceled it. Yeah. Uh, I was not. I was not very happy with it. Uh, <laughs> but as we, in those days, we, uh, at the same time we were flying uh, Apollo 17. Apollo 17 ended in December of uh, 
1972. And five months later, we flew Skylab, which was under development as we flew Apollo. So at the same time Apollo was being flown, we already had under development Skylab, which was uh, the nation's first real space station, which was the upper stage of a Saturn IV, of a Saturn V, the Saturn S4B. And uh, that, that mission uh, and, the, and the space Skylab was flown in May of 1973, five months later. So there was not a, uh, not a time where you could really, you certainly were sorry to see Apollo ended, that it would ended and a lot of people were sad about that. Uh, they laid off a lot of people around the country because of the end of the program. Uh, but at the same time, we also had the space shuttle under development. In July of uh, 1972, uh, we were working on the space shuttle. Actually, that contract got underway in July of 71. And uh, so we had, we had Skylab being flown in five months, and then we had uh, shuttle going on. And uh, we also had, at that point in time, a uh, program uh, to fly with our, our Russian, uh, Russian colleagues, uh, Apollo Soyuz. So that was a great thing about that time. It wasn't just one program. You had uh, Skylab, you had shuttle, you had Apollo Soyuz. So there was a lot going on. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, that isn't the case. And uh, uh, we were progressing, at least we thought we were progressing forward at a good rate. So, so Walt, well, you can ask a question as long as you don't freak out. <laughs> well, actually, I did not want to necessarily ask a question. I just wanted to tell you, I wanted to tell you how wonderful it is to see somebody with your experience for so many years to be so candid and honest. Um, so, um, back in uh, 2016, uh, I did a study uh, on the number of highly cited researchers per organization, and I found that NASA, which is one of our like key organizations, was one of the organizations that fell by the most number of highly cited researchers from the period of 2001 to 2014. So, um, as I was looking at it, um, the reason that is so is because of the fact that NASA does not have a PhD program. So is it a possibility that NASA can establish a PhD program? That way, like, young researchers would be interested in joining the fields, especially like in areas such as chemistry, physics, material science, nanotechnology, and biochemistry. NASA would help as a key organization in order to, um, in order to kind of boost our national morale and to also um, enhance um, the drive for collaborative research. So, so, so George, I'm not sure how much of that you heard, but the, the basic question is um, NASA as an institution used to produce lots of peer-reviewed research and the study that this young gentleman uh, undertook uh, suggested that between 2001 and 2014 that productivity in scientific papers dropped off. And he's asking if there was a possibility that NASA might uh, develop a, essentially a, a PhD program uh, that would help bring up with all these different uh, scientific and technical areas that the space program needs if NASA has thought about those kind of conditions or those kind of uh, uh, opportunities for young well, people. I think there is a, uh, a postdoc program that uh, NASA is involved in. Uh, both in, for science and engineering. And so there is a great opportunity to uh, uh, come work with uh, NASA uh, leading up to your PhD and even as uh, you, after you get your PhD uh, as a postdoc. In addition to that, I think uh, one of the great programs NASA has is a co-op program, the co-op education program, where you can actually, as you're going to school, you can take a semester off and work for NASA and work as an engineer or a scientist uh, uh, or in your, in your discipline. And uh, you go back to school and it takes you a little longer to finish school, but it gives you an opportunity to really see what the work is like uh, 
uh, before you commit yourself to a, a degree in a certain area. And uh, also you can get a great feel for what the work is like and, uh, and then uh, if you decide that, that that is what you want to do, NASA uh, usually hires the, uh, the top co-ops and uh, they come to work for NASA and that's been a great source uh, for NASA for young engineers. Unfortunately, here at Rice, we don't have that program, but uh, David assures me they're going to get it started one of these days. I've, I've, been, I've been trying for 15 years or so. Um, one, one, co one comment I would like, like to make about that, one, one, of, the, one of the things that, that NASA takes a lot of hits for a lot of the wrong reasons, sometimes because they're looked at in certain ways, but it, it, you, I, I don't doubt your study that, that things that peer-reviewed research coming out of NASA may have dropped. But 90% of the papers I've written were funded by NASA. And I can talk for many of my colleagues around the room, the papers that are being written from, by students at universities across the country and actually across the world are supported either by NASA dollars of the United States or by NASA collaboration and NASA partnerships. And I don't think NASA gets enough credit for what they do overall. And I think that's important for not just us, but our elected representatives to actually realize that. And, and you go to any NASA center around the country and have a visit. You, it's, I'm just astounded by the kind of th stuff that's done and the people there that are working. I have to say that because some of them are in the room, but, but, <laughs> but it really is quite phenomenal. And I think we underestimate, people think like, if there's a NASA center in the state, then that's a NASA state. But every state in this country is, has got major millions of dollars of NASA funded research and development. And I think that's not something that, that they get enough appreciation for. So. Well, we, we, do, we do acknowledge our sources of funding. Um, I don't know if, if, if many of the research tools like WebEx and stuff acknowledge that. They just go for authors and citations and things like that. But again, your point is good. There, there is a lot of, uh, lot of uh, excitement of the young generation and what NASA does. And NASA, I think, overall does a great job. There are various programs that work that. But I think people like myself and, and my colleagues need to maybe do more to acknowledge where that help comes from. Uh, rather than just putting a little byline at the end of a paper. So I think that's an important point. I, I think that's a fair comment. I think that's a fair comment. Jo jo okay, we'll come back to you. George, what would be your vision of the footprint for the next 30 years in space and how could we do that with our global partners? How would we need to collaborate to do that like we did with Space Station? So next, next 30 years, what, what's your vision for that and how do we bring in our global partners? A what? Uh, for the next 30 years, what's your idea of what we should be doing in the next 30 years and how do we bring in our international partners? Well, I think the great thing that has happened to the space program uh, when we started out, it turned out to be a, a competition between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. And I think it's evolved now where it's a, a program where we cooperate with other countries. And I think that's a great thing about space station that's uh, flying over us right now, that uh, many nations are involved in the program. And so I think as we look to go back to the moon, I think we need to do that under American leadership. but. We need to cooperate with these other countries around the world as, as we do on space station. And uh, I think uh, we can get back to the moon, I think, in a reasonable time if we do it the right way. There are some uh, boosters that are available uh, through SpaceX and Blue Origin uh, that aren't NASA boosters, uh, yet they're very capable. And we need to look at using those capabilities and. Uh, I think we can come up with an architecture and a plan that would take us back to the moon. And uh, I think, as I say, I think we need to look at doing it cooperatively and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, a program like that will evolve. Yeah, we have a question from online, although I think your last answer, I think maybe you have has answered part of this. This is from Drew online. He says, what do you say to motivate those at NASA today? 
your message appears to be NASA's not doing anything and not going anywhere, and you might as well not try. Is that your view as an astronaut maker? No, I think that we're doing some great things and doing great things with Space Station. And Space Station, uh, I think, is a great program, and we're just capitalizing on the Space Station and doing the experiments that we uh, have waited a good bit of time to do. So I think we need to capitalize on Space Station, and uh, it's really the foundation for moving beyond and uh, understanding the effects of long-term gravity on the human body. And Space Station is a great laboratory to do that. Space Station uh, has got a lifetime that is going to go on, I think, for much longer than 2024. So I think uh, it's a great program, and those involved uh, who are involved in it, I think it's a great experience for them. And I think if we get involved in some new activities and look at using uh, the X-37, which is that vehicle, the wing vehicle that's flying, I think that would be a great program for young people to work on. And uh, I think we need to look at, uh, again, giving the young people the opportunity to, to do more. And uh, I'm pleased when I go out to the Johnson Space Center, I look at the control center and I look around and there are a lot of young people out there and I think they're doing great things. But they need the leadership and they need the direction and the vision and uh, the program that they can go to work on. And that's what's needed and uh, I think uh, NASA is still a, a great place to work and uh, the opportunities there, I just think that we need to uh, have, make sure we got the leadership that gives them that opportunity. So I think we have time for a couple more questions, or maybe three questions. There's one here. Thank you. Hi, George. Oh, uh, first of all, I want to commend you. Uh, you appear to have spoken for more than an hour, maybe and a half, without notes. I can't do it for five minutes. So, uh, I want to ask P. Con uh, P. Conrad of Apollo 12. He and his crew apparently retrieved a piece of equipment off of some that had been left on the moon. The purpose was to determine whether there had been any deterioration or what have you to that equipment. I've never read what the results were. What was that? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, it was analyzed, but I don't I haven't seen the report. I'm sure if you Google, you probably find sign that write the report somewhere in the NASA archives. So I've noticed throughout your conversation that you have not mentioned the Orion program. How do you feel about the Orion program now after Con Constellation kind of hacked it to small pieces? Can, can you comment on your thoughts about the, the current state of the Orion program? Well, uh, if you're going to develop a spacecraft, you want it to do something and uh, have some capability. And the amount of money that they invested in Orion is not going to give you much capability. So, and it's a very heavy spacecraft, and it's not going to fly for a long time. And uh, they have weight problems. And uh, if you get it up too high, we, you, when you impact into the ocean, which it will if it flies, it uh, can can impact at a pretty good rate of descent. On Apollo, we had a command module that we uh, had a, a goal of when we started out to make it 8,500 pounds. And when we flew, it was to weigh 12,500 pounds. And it was a very capable command module. I think Walt, Walt would attest to that. And uh, uh, I'm looking at the money that we're putting in Orion, and I really wonder, is it really worth it? Hi, so I'm a current intern at JSC, working on the uh, Deep Space Gateway. Um, I, I won't argue with you about the merits of that, but uh, <laughs> but what advice do you have to young adults such as myself that aspire to join the agency and help get humans back to the moon and beyond? What was that, Pat? 
I'd go to work. I'd go back. I'd see if I'd go on space station. <laughs> As I've advised, I think I've advised another individual here to do that same thing. Uh, There is a lot of women in space. There are women in space now. Yes. I think that's a great thing. Right. So I would I would I mean I would point out that one of the reasons are so many women I think the great thing great thing about uh, the program today, another very good thing, is if you go out and look at the control center today. Uh, probably the majority of the women in, in the majority of the people in the control center and on the consoles are women. And if you look at back in Apollo, uh, I don't think you'll see a woman there. And uh, so women are playing an increasingly important role in the program. And I think that's great. I think uh, that's a, been a very good thing, not only with as, as astronauts, but also engineers and scientists. And they've uh, contributed a lot to what we've been doing. Uh, again, as I was saying, I think a lot of the credit for how many women are involved in the space program goes down to the gentleman in front of you, actually. So, <laughs> so I saw another hand up there, but it seems to have gone down. So I think I think Walt is going to um, sort of finish with the last the last comment here. Thank you. <clears throat> I didn't realize I was making the last comment. But I will say this, I see one of the problems is how broad, uh, okay, I see one of the problems is how much NASA has broadened itself out. Back in the 1960s, they were focused on what the objective was. Over the, the years, the last 50 years, they've also uh, moved a lot towards uh, various social activities on it. Now those are good things to have to be done, but that's not the most efficient way to do it. And while the budget has stayed, well actually it's been moving down, they have taken on more and more uh, social uh, tactics on it. Another ma major change I see is back when NASA was raising money to get started, they were opening up centers around the country. Why? Occasionally those centers might be something that they needed. But frequently, those centers were opened so they could get the support of the senators and the congressmen in that particular state. And we should be closing out at least half of those things since then and focusing what we're doing on getting the job done, not all these other social things. I'm actually going to give George the last word if you want to say one, one final word before we close out this evening. What, would you, what message would you give to Walt and everyone else in the room? You want me to say something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I think what we do, we've had a, certainly this country's had a great space program and uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of it and Walt as well. And, uh, uh, we were involved in it during some great, great days, and I just hope that we can return and uh, make it great again. And uh, I'm hopeful that it, we, we will. And uh, I think it's going to take a lot of effort, but I think it can be done, and I'm very hopeful it will be done. So God bless you all.